So right off the bat, I just want to mention that if you're watching this video because your furnace is not working, you should check out my other video where I talk about how to clean the flame sensor and go into depth about that. That's the video you're probably looking for. In this video, I'll be going over more of the technical stuff about the flame sensor, but this one will be useful for you as well. So if you want, stay for both. So this here is a flame sensor, and all a flame sensor is is literally just a stainless steel rod with a porcelain cover or a ceramic cover covering a portion of the flame sensor. And if you're ever grabbing the flame sensor with some pliers, maybe it's really hot when you're taking it out, make sure that you don't put a tooth wrench or any wrench for that matter on the ceramic or the porcelain part because that tends to crack very easily. And another thing you don't want to do is touch it with your fingers because the oil residue from your fingers will stay on the flame sensor and that will create like a attractive spot for all the dust particles and carbon to glue onto. So your flame sensor will get a lot dirtier a lot faster if you put your fingerprints all over it. So just touch the part that's covered up. But anyways, I got this flame sensor out from my burners right here from behind the burners right over here and like I described in my previous video if you're having a flame sensor issue what that will look like is your burners your burners will come on for about three seconds and come right off another thing to keep in mind is your igniter which is on this side right here in fact I can take it out to show you guys there's two kinds of igniters. There's there's silicon silicon carbide and silicon nitride. The carbide one, which is the one I have right here. The shiny one. This is actually very brittle. So if you try to clean this up on accident instead of a flame sensor, this will break very easily. I would show you an example of how easily it breaks, but I don't have any spares on me, so I don't want to break my igniter. But anyways, just make sure you don't actually try to clean up the igniter instead of the flame sensor. An easy way to tell which one's which is by the wires. The igniters will always have two wires going to them, whereas the flame sensor only has a single wire going to it. So let's put that back. And while I'm on the igniter topic, just so you know, if you have an igniter that's a spark igniter and you don't have a flame sensor, that means your spark igniter is most likely acting as a flame rod as well. You cannot check, in most furnaces, you cannot check a spark igniter slash flame sensor with the meter. If you try to do that, you'll just end up frying your meter. On some furnaces you can do it, but on most, you'll end up just wrecking the meter instead. And before we check our flame sensor with the meter, I just want to briefly explain in the technical language of how this all works. So the way it works is the control board sends, on average, it can be a range between like 50 to 180 volts. On average, it's about 90 volts that I see on flame sensors. The control board will send 90 volts to the flame sensor, and you can actually check that with the meter. I'll show you how in a second. So the 90 volts AC alternating current that is applied to the flame sensor or sent by the control board, that actually uses the flame as a resistant path. The ions in the flame act as a path for the electrons coming from the flame sensor. It jumps onto the flame and then travels to the burner face. And the way alternating current works is the current goes back and forth. And because the burner face is a lot bigger than the surface of the flame rod, there's a lot more current going one way than coming back the other way. And that's what we call flame rectification. And as you know, if current is only going one way, it is actually DC current. So that AC current actually turns into DC current, which we will read with a meter. When you're testing a flame sensor with a meter, what you're actually checking is for DC microamps. So once the current gets to the burner face, that is sensed by the control board, the DC offset, and then the control board sends the signal to the gas valve to stay open. Now, if it's not getting that signal, then the gas valve will shut off and that pretty much looks like your normal flame sensor issue where the burners only come on for like three seconds and then turn right off. Another thing to check for when you're troubleshooting furnaces is for a loose ground or a broken ground. Right here you have the ground wires. One of them is coming from the control board. If this is loose or broken off, 
sometimes that will cause your flame sensor issue as well. So you clean up your flame sensor, you plug it in, but it's still doing the same problem. So what you would check for first is if you have 90 volts, and then you would put your meter in series to see if you have the microamps, which will be the reading that will show you if you have a connection to ground or not. And another reminder I wanna make is if the furnace control board senses that the, there's a flame sensor issue, like five times in a row, a lot of furnaces will go into a soft lockout, meaning that for three hours, the furnace will sit there and do absolutely nothing. A way to reset that is to just flip your furnace switch off, wait for about five seconds and flip it back on and your furnace will resume and start trying all over again. And just so you know, sometimes cleaning the flame sensor is not enough. You also once in a while have to end up cleaning the burner face as well. And in shop burners like mine right here, this style is very easy to clean. And I just want to show you quick if I manage to put the right bit on. There's this front plate right here over my burners that helps secure them in place. That is very easy to take out. All you gotta do most of the time is just two or four screws holding it. So if you take those screws out, you can take this plate out. Be careful of the igniter, that igniter that I mentioned that was fragile. If you touch it with your fingers, it'll create a hot spot, which will cause it to burn out faster. Or if you touch it hard enough, then you can break it all together. So you can take out this plate, put it on the bottom of the cabinet here. And these in-shop burners, they just pop right out. These are super easy. For example, I'll pull one out just to show you. Usually, mainly you're gonna be concerned about the one that's in front of the flame sensor. That's the one you wanna clean. As you can see, there's a little bit of buildup on mine. Sometimes there will be a ton of rust and corrosion. And to clean them, you can just use a brass brush or some sandpaper or that same Scotch-Brite pad, some steel wool, whatever you have on hand. Just clean that up and you can see how much of a difference this brush is making. This also helps with high carbon monoxide readings. If you clean the burner faces, sometimes that'll drop the carbon monoxide pretty drastically. So you clean the burners up like that. You can add some sandpaper to really shine up the metal because what that flame sensor is making a connection to through the flame is literally just the base or the face of the burner here. And then we can put that back in the same way we took it out. You put it on the orifice first on the gas manifold right here. And then you slide it back into place like that. And let's leave this little plate off here first and get to the interesting part, which is checking the flame sensor with a meter. So I'll just set this right over here. And we can turn our furnace on. And before we turn our furnace on, if you have an alligator clip for your meter leads, it works very nice. Just put the alligator clip on one lead. And then take the wire that goes to your flame sensor and disconnect it from it. And put your alligator lead onto the terminal spade from the flame sensor. Like that. And then take your other lead and you don't want to spread the connector that's inside the insulation here. So take your other lead and put it between the insulator and that metal terminal like that. So it goes both ways. You're not wrecking the connector and you have a nice secure connection. You can let go of the meter if you want. Just make sure it's not touching anything metal. Now that we have that set up, basically we just set our meter up in series with the flame sensor. So we can turn the power back on. Turn it to UA amps, because what we're looking for is DC micro amps, right? And this meter automatically detects which one it is. So this one on top is AC, this one on the bottom is DC. So what we're looking for is anywhere from 1.5 to 3.5. Anything lower than that is bad. It means our flame sensor is dirty or for some reason we're losing a connection somewhere. As you can see, I'm right in between the range, 2.4. That means that I have a good flame sensor reading going on here and I shouldn't be having any problems. And if you look at the burners here, once again, this is simulating a dirty flame sensor. If I interrupt that connection or the microamps, 
burners come off in two seconds. And we can plug this lead back in to where I got it from. My igniter is already glowing to retry. The furnace will light right back up. And another thing I want to show you is uh, the voltage. Remember how I was saying you should have some voltage going from your control board to the flame sensor? So if I take my lead and I put it on the metal part of the flame sensor, or sometimes you can even just touch the flame sensor itself with your lead, but you want to do that quickly, otherwise the flame will burn the rubber part. I, I usually like to do it here instead. That way you don't have to deal with the rubber melting or anything. So you put one lead on the flame sensor terminal and the other on ground. And what I accidentally just did is I shorted my, using my lead, I shorted my flame sensor straight to the burner. And if the control board on most furnaces, if the control board detects that there is an AC short instead of DC microamps, it'll shut everything off. So if anybody gets a bad idea of trying to jumper the flame sensor straight to ground, because that's where it's going anyway, you cannot bypass a flame sensor like that on most furnaces because as you just saw, the furnace will just shut right off. But anyways, back to my little test without touching the burners this time. So one lead goes on the flame sensor terminal and the other one just put on ground. As you can see, I have 54 volts. On most furnaces, it'll be closer to 90. But any voltage, basically, what you're checking for is that the control board is sending voltage to the flame sensor. If you have the igniter glowing, but you have no voltage at the flame sensor, then you know that the problem is actually the control board or maybe some wiring issue where there's a broken wire and not the flame sensor itself. And another cool thing I like to do sometimes, you know how I previously explained that the ions in the flame make a high resistant path for the electrons from the flame sensor to jump onto? So if you think about it, that means that there's literally voltage in the flame. So if you wanted to, you could stick one lead into the base of the flame and the other lead on your flame sensor, and you should have some kind of voltage present. So just for experiment purposes, let's give that a try. I'll put one lead into the flame from the bottom. It's gonna be hard to see on camera, but I explained what I'm doing into the flame and the other lead onto the flame sensor. And as you can see, I have eight volts present in the flame. So that's kind of cool that you can actually read voltage inside the flame. Well guys, and that is how you check your flame sensor with a meter. And just a few last pointers before we end this video here. If you're a technician doing this, I would recommend that you have all these tools because they will definitely make your life easier. On some furnaces, flame sensors can be a real big pain to access because they're behind like the burner box on 90% furnaces like carriers, for example. This flexible bit holder is very good to have. And it's good for anything really, for blower motors, you know where the screws are on top and just for other stuff. Then you should definitely have a 12 inch bit extension. This one is, this one I use the most often. It's just a four inch bit extension, magnetic. Then the 75 degree bit, where if I put in a bit into this thing, it's just nice that it's short because if you try to angle this one like that, as you can see, the space is like four inches. So if you're going for a short space, this one is really nice because you can get into really crammed spaces. And if you got a Phillips, that's the nuisance, you can get yourself a angled little wrench like this that has Phillips on one side and flat on the other. This can get into some really tight spaces too. It got me out of a few tight spaces before. And another thing I wanna mention is one of the guys at work I work with, he's been doing this for like 30 years. He always cleans his flame sensors with this brass wire brush. He says it works great and it doesn't scratch it. So just another option for you if you wanna try using that. And while we're on the topic of coworkers, I had a supervisor that has also been doing this forever, probably like 20, 30 years. He said that never in his life has he replaced a flame sensor. Cause really it's just a stainless steel rod. He said that you're always able to clean them up. Sometimes they do get really nasty, like they'll have a lot of carbon buildup on them. They'll turn green to the point where you have to use sandpaper just to get it off. If it got to that point, then you're going to be cleaning it a lot more often. If that's the case, then you may be better off just replacing it and getting it over with, and they can forget about their furnace for another 5-10 years. 
And another thing I've done out in the field is if I'm replacing a flame sensor for some reason and I don't have the right one, for example, all I have is the straight flame sensors, but I need the L-shaped one, you can bend those things. Um, just put some cloth on your wrenches, whatever wrenches you're using, so you're not putting any scratch or bite marks into it. Then grab the flame sensor with both wrenches and just bend it into the shape you want. Do keep in mind though that sometimes, doesn't happen very often, but sometimes that flame sensor can snap. So I only use that in a pinch, or if the flame sensor for some reason is just way out of the flame zone, you can bend it a little bit closer. But of course you don't want it to be touching anything metal because then it'll short out and the control board will shut everything off. Which reminds me, I didn't mention this earlier, but the flame sensor, I don't want to take mine back out, but let's say this is the flame sensor and this is the burner face, let's say. The flame sensor should be enveloped in the flame and it should be at the base of the flame. So not too far from the burner itself. So usually, let's say this is the burner face, the round burner, it'll be about right here. So not in the middle. You don't want it to be completely in the middle because then the carbon buildup will be really quick. You want it to be either this side or this side. Although I have seen them in the middle before and it doesn't make that much of a difference it seems. But the recommended place for it, like I said earlier, is kind of a little off the center. Between the edge and the center, either on one side or the other. Well guys, and that's all I had about the flame sensor for you. If you have anything else I missed, or if you know some other cool facts or some troubleshooting tips that you can share with everybody, including myself, please let us know in the comments below. That'll be much appreciated. I hope you got a lot out of this video. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to mash that like button on the way out, and we'll see you next time.